Open your Bible to John 7. We are going week by week through the book of John, and we are at chapter 7. Hopefully you've read it beforehand. If not, remember for the following week when you see the next chapter coming up, read that ahead of time. It always helps prepare. 164 years ago, 164 years ago, in the fall of 1852, the Sisters of Laredo left Kentucky and crossed the continent to establish a convent in the southwestern desert. The ancient village to which they were headed was actually founded in 1610 by the Spanish and was known as the City of the Holy Faith, or La Villa de la Santa Fe. Santa Fe, New Mexico, right? Yeah? Yeah? Woo! I practiced. <laughs> Some two decades after the sisters had arrived, Mexican carpenters had begun to construct a chapel for them. And they wanted the chapel to be patterned off of the Saint Chapelle in Paris. So this Gothic architecture with a choir loft in the rear started to be constructed. It started in 1873, and five years later, the Laredo Chapel was completed, or almost. We had the beautiful sanctuary, we had the wonderful loft in the back, but there was no way to connect the two. The carpenters had forgotten, had failed to, didn't know how to put a stairwell in there. It just was too short a space. And so they said, well, we'll just leave it out. And the sisters can climb up the ladder. Well, the sisters didn't think that was working so well. So they started to consult with different carpenters, get someone in here who can possibly figure out how to put stairwells. And, and person after person, carpenter after comp carpenter gave the same answer. A conventional staircase will never work. It can't be done. So the sisters said, well, with God, that's not a word in his vocabulary. So they started to pray. And the sisters had what's called a novena. That's a nine-day period of prayer. And so they started the noveno. I guess it's noveno, not novena. They, novena, it is an ah? Uh, it is, novena. Okay, so nine days of focused prayer. And they prayed particularly to St. Joseph. Why? <laughs> yes, he's a carpenter. Well, God listened as well. So they prayed, and, uh, and they prayed, and they prayed. And on the ninth day, the final and last day, this old man, gray-haired man, starts walking up. He has a donkey with him, and he's carrying a tool chest. And he stopped at the convent. He sees the mother superior, and he tells her, he's like, I, I hear you have a, a, a need, a problem. I, I heard that you need a stairwell, and I'm wondering if perhaps I can help. And so the mother superior said, well, have at it. You can do something? Great. Go for it. So he took his toolbox out. He had only the crudest of tools in that tool chest, and the man went to work. He was eight months working, painstakingly, applying his obvious skill and using only these tools. And then one morning, the mother superior awakened to find the job completed, and the carpenter was gone. Now, I would love, and I totally forgot, if you guys can pull up, hey, Eddie, if you can pull up on the internet the Laredo Chapel stairwell image, you can get a glimpse of this. The sisters gathered around at the, in the chapel, and they looked at this amazing piece of incredible masterwork. The staircase was narrow. It was a spiral staircase that made two complete 360-degree turns. It had exactly 33 steps going up. There was no banister. There was no center support. It was precision fit and meticulously held together with barely perceptible wooden pegs. It was beautiful to the point of seeming alive. So the carpenter, who was never paid and never seen again, they, they were a little worried, so they checked to see if they could finally go, like, figure out how to follow up and find him. They went to the local, uh, local lumber supplier and asked if anyone purchased wood recently. No record of wood having been purchased for that project. The builders and engineers through the years have come to this chapel and looked at this staircase and examined it and affirmed that its full weight appears to rest at the base of the stairs which structurally should have collapsed. There it is. Is that not amazing? 
Structurally, the, the engineers say it should have collapsed the first time it was used, yet it had been used every day for 100 years or more. And here's another strange thing, and though it was, it was built on the spot, the unidentified hardwood that was used in it was nowhere, came nowhere near Mexico. You could not find that kind of wood anywhere near Mexico. It's a mystery, right? TV, you've heard the show Unsolved Mysteries? They highlighted the staircase in their show, and there's been movies made on it because it continues to baffle. Beyond understanding, you can take the picture down, thanks. Beyond understanding, beyond common sense, from the most ordinary visitor, this answer to prayer, that stairwell, stands today. And it's a reminder of anyone who knows the story of the unexpected provisions and remedies of our great God. Who knows when, how, and what needs to happen in our lives? A God who shows up. And when he does, things happen. John chapter 7 is about this God. Our whole Bible, our whole Bible is our stories of a God. And who is this God? How do we know him? What is his heart? And chapter 7 shows us a God who shows up and a God who chooses the best time to do it. John chapter 7 couple verses. So after this, Jesus, he went around in Galilee. He had had some confrontation with the Jews in Judea. He went up to Galilee where they were a little bit more open-minded, a little bit more open thinkers, more accepting. And so he decided to refresh himself. However, get his, get his bearings there. After this, Jesus went around in Galilee, purposely staying away from Judea because the Jews there were waiting to take his life. But when the Jewish Feast of Tabernacles was near, Jesus' brothers said to him, you ought to leave here and go to Judea so that your disciples may see the miracles you do. No one wants to become a public figure. No one who wants to become a public figure acts in secret. Since you are doing these things, show yourself to the world. For even his own brothers did not believe in him. And therefore Jesus told them, the right time for me has not yet come. For you, any time is right. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify that what it does is evil. You go to the feast. I am not yet going up to this feast because for me, the right time has not yet come. Having said this, he stayed in Galilee. However, after his brothers had left for the feast, he went also, not publicly, but in secret. Now, interesting, because when I'm first reading this, I'm thinking, did Jesus just lie? Did Jesus just lie? He said he's not going to the feast, and then as soon as they leave, he goes. Hmm. All right, so here's, we dig into the word a little bit. What we certainly find out here is Jesus thoughtfully considering the timing of things. The word, it is not yet my time. The right time for me has not yet come. You've heard this, and through John, this is throughout the book, where Jesus says, my time has not yet come. My time has not yet come. Typically, in every instance, except this one, but in every other instance, when he's talking about my time has not yet come, he's using the word aura which means in Greek, the destined hour of God. My destined hour, my destined time, my destiny where I'm supposed to make something happen has not yet come. But in this instance, in this only in here, in this passage right here, it means a different word, kairos. And that word means it's not the best opportunity right now. It's not the best psychological moment for me to appear at this time. It's not the most opportune time for me to show up. It's not about destiny. It's about thoughtfully thinking through the best time to make his appearance. Now, it's interesting because the family tried to tell him what was the best thing to do. Here's what you need to do, Jesus. For the best strategy, if you want to really make a difference as, as a public figure, bit of sarcasm in there because they didn't really believe he was Jesus, I really didn't believe he was the Christ. But Jesus knows who he's about. He knows what he's about and who he ultimately needs to listen to. And again, throughout John, we've already studied several chapters, and in partic particularly in chapter 3 and 5, we saw how he mentions over and over how he only does what the Father tells him to do. He only does the will of the Father. He only does what he who sent me does. God knows where his center, Jesus knew where his center was, was in God the Father. And when I read this passage, I think, okay, in those heated areas of our own lives, 
There's plenty of people who want to tell us what's best, what's most effective, what the popular answer is in our culture, in our times. For that particular problem, this is what you need to do. And the question is, where do we find our center? Where do we find our answers? Where do you go for direction? Who are we surrounding ourselves with that can influence us, that will influence us? It's hard sometimes to go against the grain when others who you love and who love and care for you are telling you, but ultimately our responsibility to, our only answer is to God and what he's leading us how he's leading us, and he promises to guide us. He promises to give us the wisdom that we need, and he promises to tell us to go, even in the Old Testament it says, to the left or to the right. That's specific. That's our personal God. Godly advice can be given by those who, who seek after God as well, but ultimately we have our decisions that go with God. And the best way to follow in the footsteps of Jesus, I think we find in this passage, is to center ourselves in his word. In God's word, to center ourselves in God's spirit, to center ourselves in the ultimate voice and authority of Jesus in our life. It's interesting, his words, that he says, for you, any time is right. He tells his brother, for you, any time is right. And that kind of sounds a little bit like a, a little bit of a pushback, a little slam. And I thought about, you know, if you don't have a message that you're giving to the world, if you're not planning, if you are not planning to make any kind of difference in the world, if you're not planning to make an impact in the world, you don't need to worry about timing, do you? If you're not planning on making a difference in someone's life or in your community or in your neighborhood, you don't need to necessarily tune in to where God wants you if you're not planning to make any difference. You can show up in life wherever, do whatever, go wherever. It doesn't matter much if you're not really planning on making a difference. But Jesus, he's aware that he is going to make an impact. And whenever Jesus arrives someplace, I don't care where it is in scripture, whenever Jesus arrives, something happens. Whenever Jesus arrives, something always happens happens. And we show, we, we look down here in just the next verse, it show, says that he showed up then. He went in his secret way and he ended up in the middle of the feast. He ended up speaking at the end of this feast, he ended up speaking. And when he showed up, something happened. He proclaimed truth. He taught. He revealed who he was in profound ways. He brought life. Something happened when Jesus showed up. So tuning in for Jesus or for anyone who wants to make a difference in this world, whether with your family or out in the community, is essential. Now what I found interesting was in verse 10 through 13. So he says, however, after his brothers had left for the feast, he went also, not publicly, but in secret. Now at the feast, the Jews were watching for him and asking, where is that man? Among the crowds, there was widespread whispering about him. Some said, he's a good man. Others replied, no, he deceives the people. But no one would say anything publicly about him for fear of the Jews, particularly verse 11 and 12. So the Jews were looking for him. The Jews, the authorities of this time, Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes, the Jews expected Jesus to show up. They expected that Jesus would be there because he has shown in his life based on who he was and what he'd already done, Jesus was about making impressions. Jesus was about making a difference. Jesus was about showing up and doing something again and again and again. And when he showed up, the impression that he sought to make was the impression of God's heart on ours. He impressed God's heart into the environment, an impression of who God is, his heart, his kingdom ways. And whenever God showed up, whenever Jesus showed up, he left questions in the wake. Questions that left, as we see, some concluding that he was good and some concluding that he was not so good. But what was not in question, what was not in question was that Jesus was going to show up and that when Jesus showed up, something was going to happen. I think about our own lives. Here, here we have the Jews who didn't like him, the Jews who didn't want him, the Jews who did not believe in him, and yet they knew this to be true about Jesus, that he shows up in life. 
that when he does show up, he stirs, he acts, he moves, he makes an impact, and he makes a difference whenever he shows up. Our own lives, if the Jews who were out to disparage him, if they were out to shut him down, if they knew this and looked for it and expected it of Jesus, shouldn't we also in our own lives, in those own places, are we expecting Jesus to show up in the middle of our conflicts, in the middle of our trials, in the middle of our sufferings, in the middle of our stress, in our relationships, in our finances, in our questions, in our stirrings? Are we expecting Jesus to show up and do something? Amen. Isaiah 41, 10 and 13 tells us we should because it says, do not fear. These are God's words, do not fear for I am with you. Amen. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I am the Lord, your God, who takes hold of your right hand and says, do not fear, for I will help you. Jesus was there. He showed up, and the Jewish leaders and crowds who did not know Jesus as their Lord and Savior knew he would show up and things would happen but what did they think about the things that he did? They knew he would show up and they knew something was happening, was going to happen. But what did they think about those things that he did? What was the response of the Jewish authorities and the mob and the crowd, the people? The rest or much of chapter seven is about the response to Jesus showing up and doing something. Some thought that what he would do would be good. Others thought that what he did was bad, and others thought that it was so bad that they needed to eliminate him from their sight, from their lives, from the world. When we think about Jesus, who we think Jesus is affects what we think he's going to do when he shows up. Who we think Jesus is affects what we think he's going to do in our lives when he shows up. For instance, do we believe that Jesus, the Son of God, do we believe in our heart of hearts that he is one who loves us unconditionally, truly? Or do we think that he is really one that judges us? Do we think that God, Jesus, is one that truly cares or is only looking out for what we're doing wrong in our life? Do we believe that God, Jesus, is personally involved in our lives, or do we believe that we're out on our own except for matters of spirituality? Do we believe that Jesus is one who advocates and fights for us by our side to turn things around in our life ultimately for our good, or do we believe that he lets things Go as they may. The chips will fall where they fall. You made your bed, you lie in it. Who and what do you believe about Jesus? Our view of God, our view of God is built on what we've been taught. It's built on what we've experienced with God, what other people who represent who God is, what they say about God. It comes from our interpretation of our scriptures. And here's a little self checkpoint as we read through John 7 and we see the divisions between he's a good God. No, he's not so good. He's not God at all. He's a deceiver. He's no, he's the Messiah. We see the division. And here's the checkpoint. If our view of who Jesus is leads to a worse place, leads us to a worse place, leads us to where we feel more condemned and alone, if we feel that more than feeling embraced, and loved and guided by God, then it's probably time that we need to question our view of who God is, that we need to question what we've been taught, question what we've experienced. I believe that a, a faith that does not question, a blind faith is not a very deep faith. If we don't have a faith that's willing to learn and grow and expand, then we're missing out on the depths that God has for us. There's an illustration I wanna share with you 
about the need to question and how blind faith is not so great. I experienced the need to question my view when I came out of Starbucks the other day. It was about two weeks ago. And I came out of Starbucks and I had my, my hot chocolate and I had my phone and I'm going and I look up and I see my car and I'm heading right over there. And I'm, you know, I'm gonna clap fast pace. I'm, I'm task mode and I'm going, going, going. I get to the car and I rip open the door, <laughs> just boom. And I'm about ready to get in. And there's this lady sitting in my car and she's on the phone. And she's like, oh, I mean, she's just like, what? She probably thought I was going to carjack her or something. So I'm like, what? what is this lady doing in my car? And I'm looking and she's on, she's like, uh, uh, hang on a second. And she's talking on the speaker phone. I'm like, how is her speaker? How is her phone working in my car? And all of a sudden, there's a split moment, and I realize, oh, this isn't my car. My car is right next to hers. <laughs> and it looked exactly like it. And I said, I am so sorry. Let me just close your door, and I'll just go over here. We laughed, and it was good. But I, I realized I needed to question my view. I needed to take a moment, and what I thought I knew, take a moment and say, no, that wasn't quite correct. And I ended up in the wrong place because I didn't question. And the same thing is here. It's in questioning and it's in questing after God's heart in seeking truth that we find God, that we find a deeper God, that we find a truer God, that we find the kingdom of God when we quest, when we look at it from different angles, when we try and we discover. Matthew 6 says, those who seek the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven first, will have all these things added to them. All these things include a right understanding of who Jesus is in our lives. Truth about who he is in the scriptures. Deuteronomy 4.29 says, those who seek him with all their hearts will find him. And the scriptures are full of places that you can land on that you'll find that God is a God of love. God is a God who does not judge us, who never leaves us, who is our advocate to raise us up to walk with him, who works all things for our ultimate God, our ultimate good. He is a God we can trust. Amen. So what's your view of God? Who is Jesus? He's going to show up. He's going to show up and he's going to do something in your life. You want to know if it's something that you can trust or it's something you gotta fight and resist when he starts working in your life. So the more you learn about who God is, the more you know you can trust who he is. But the people in those day, the people in that day, the people in our day, not always so united on that. They were united on knowing and expecting that Jesus shows up and does something. And they were looking for it, but they were not united on what they expected he was going to do, what their, what their assumptions about what he would do. Was it going to be good or was it going to be bad? You look through from verse 12 through the very end to verse 50, and here's how it flip-flops between the different peoples. Verse 12, he's good. Same verse, no, he deceives. Verse 15, he's ignorant and uneducated. Verse 20, he's demon-possessed. He's a madman. Verse 25, he's a prime suspect for blasphemy, and we need to kill him. Verse 26, well, maybe he is the Christ. Excuse me, verse 27, no, he can't be. He can't be the Christ because we know where he comes from. Verse 30, he's a criminal that's worth seizing. Verse 31, some said they put their faith in him, so they believed he was something more than just man. Verse 32, the Pharisees and the chief priests were threatened by him. 25 through 36, a man who does not make sense. Verse 40, he's a prophet. Verse 41, he's the Messiah. Verse 41 through 44, he's not the Messiah because he doesn't have the right background. Verse 45 through 46, the temple guard said, he's a dynamic speaker. Verse 47 through 49, the pair of Pharisees were disgusted by that claim. He said, really? Take a look. And verse 50, we see Nicodemus defending him. He's a man who deserves to be heard. See how it flip-flops. The division was there. They were united that God was something. Jesus was someone they needed to keep an eye on. He was going to do something. What that something was, was it good or was it bad? It's not hard to see when you look at how Jesus lived his life. It's not hard to see sometimes how the accusations that he was a madman could come about, could have stuck. Because when Jesus showed up, the something that he always did didn't always make sense to man. I love how the commentator William Barclay puts it. 
He said, either Jesus is the only completely sane person in the world, or he was mad. He chose a cross when he might have had power. He was the suffering servant when he might have been the conquering king. He washed the feet of the disciples when he might have had men kneeling at his own feet. He came to serve when he could have subjected the world to servitude. It is not common sense that the words of Jesus give us, but uncommon sense. He turned the world's standards upside down because into a mad world, he brought the supreme sanity of God. Is that not beautiful? Is that not beautiful? Don't we know this in the reality of our own lives? Don't we know this in the reality of our own lives? Sometimes God's ways appear and feel to us as completely mad and don't make sense. We ask God, what are you doing? What are you up to? You are a God who can provide at the snap of a finger. You can do anything. What are you doing in my life? I don't see you. What are you up to? And nothing feels like it's on the right track. And we wonder sometimes, are you even hearing us at all? And we can relate to the Psalms in those times in a huge, huge way. But I think our expectations, our expectations have something to do with it. If we're expecting God to show up in the way that we have outlined for him, we might be a little surprised. If we think that God's going to show up in a way that seems effective to us, that makes sense to us, surely this is what God will do, then we can often miss his activity and his work that he is doing because we're looking for something else. We miss his presence and his provision that shows up in the ordinary course of life, in the ordinary routines, in the ordinary conversations, in the ordinary processes of day in and day out. And perhaps God shows up and he's a bit more normal in how he works in our lives than we expect or want. So often we want something huge, the spectacular, the voice that we hear, the, the miracle that we see. And God is working through the ordinary paths of our lives. I think this is what they struggled with back then. There was a popular belief that everyone seemed to know of who and how the Messiah would show up. They believed, they did not believe that Jesus was the Messiah because they knew exactly where Jesus came from. He came from Nazareth. We know where Jesus came from. They knew his brothers and sisters. There was no mystery about Jesus. They knew who he was. He went against everything that they understood the Messiah and how he would appear. The popular belief back then was that the Messiah would somehow be concealed and then one day burst suddenly upon the world and no one would know would know where he came from. No one would know anything about him, except one thing, one thing they gave, that they would know that he was gonna be born in Bethlehem, David's town. That was the only given. Everything else was gonna be a surprise and a mystery. There was a rabbinic saying that said, three things come wholly unexpectedly. The Messiah, a godsend, and a scorpion. You don't wanna be surprised by a scorpion, stepping on a scorpion. Three things. So here's Jesus. Here's Jesus being very ordinary. No one has anything written about him in his first 30 years. Nothing spectacular apparently happened. He was so ordinary doing his carpenter work, traveling, whatever he was doing. So ordinary. He lived an ordinary life with an ordinary background, doing ordinary things growing up in the course of an ordinary life. There's no way that God could be that ordinary. Certainly God only shows up in the spectacular, the unusual, and the extraordinary. And they missed seeing him for who he was and they missed out on the blessings he brought because they looked for him in the unexpected. I think, wow, where might God be already working in our lives, in the ordinary places of our lives and we just don't see it because we're not looking there. And I think, gosh, we need to pray to have our eyes opened and our hearts open to see. And if we don't see, to trust and know that he is there and he is working. Because we know in scripture, without a doubt, God shows up. Second Corinthians tells us that we are God's temple. 
and his spirit dwells in us. Galatians says that Jesus Christ lives in us. So we know God has already shown up in our lives. God is dwelling in our lives. He has shown up every bit in our lives as he showed up physically in these stories of the New Testament. And it says that he's a God who continues to show up and he's a God that continues to do something. In Philippians 4.13, it says, this same God who takes care of me will supply all your needs from his glorious riches. This is present tense. A God who is the same God who takes care and supplies all your needs from his glorious riches which have been given to us in Christ Jesus who is in us. Scripture after scripture tells us that God is good and God is love. We have Romans 8, 28 that says all things, he works all things together for good, for our ultimate good, even when it appears to not be making any sense at all in our lives. Even when it seems like nothing spectacular is going on or profound going on around us or in us, God is still there. He is still showing up and he is making something happen. And we know that by faith, by what the scripture tells us is true. Ecclesiastes 8 says, who can understand the ways of God? We can't. Isaiah 55, my ways and thoughts are, aren't yours. They are far greater than your imagination. And Proverbs 3 says, therefore, trust in God. Lean not on your own understanding. Walk by faith, not by sight. Perhaps what chapter seven is reminding us about is despite the division of conflict, back then and in our own lives, is what God's doing, is he doing something and is what he's doing good for my life? In these places that feel like nothing makes sense or when it feels like nothing out of the ordinary is happening, that is where we need to realize God has shown up and to keep our eyes and our spirits alert to the plans he is in the process of doing. That his something will manifest itself in his kairos, in the most opportune time for our lives. He will teach us, he will unfold a miracle, he will share a revelation. Whatever we need in our lives is what Jesus will bring. That's what he did in the Feast of the Tabernacles. In the last part of the chapter, the Feast of the Tabernacles, he, he revealed himself in this incredible way. It was October 15, that's where it happens. And this festival was one of the great three festivals, the Passover, the Pentecost, and the Tabernacles. And what people would do is they'd leave their homes for eight days, and they'd build, build these, these non-permanent structures out of palm fronds and, and branches and willow branches. And they would build them on flat roofs, on the houses, on streets, on the city squares, in the gardens, even in the temple courts, these structures would go up. Every Everyone left their houses and dwelt in these little structures. The structures had to allow sunshine to come in. They could protect them from the elements of the weather, but they had to have enough openings that the sunshine could come in. And the slats over top with the fronds, they had to be able to see the stars at night. Those were two requirements. The historical significance is it was reminding the Jewish people of their heritage, that they had once been homeless wanderers in the desert without a roof over their heads. It reminded them to praise God because he provided for them and got them through the desert times. It had agricultural significance because not only did he provide, but he provided abundantly. October 15 was the end of the harvest for the grapes, the barley, the wheat. And they had all this harvest come in. It was abundant. And everyone from the rich to the poor, the servants, the, the strangers within the gates, they all celebrated the provision of God. That it was not just to get by, it was abundant provision in their lives. On the final day of the feast, and this is where Jesus shows up, and does something great. On the final day of the feast, they would process. They would carry their willows and their palms and they'd march around the altar seven times. On the last day, they went around seven times, like seven times around Jericho. They go around seven times and then the priest would take the golden pitcher. He would go down to the pool of Siloam, fill it with water, and then he'd carry it back through the water gate. 
And all the while, people would be reciting behind him as he carried this, with joy, it was from Isaiah 12, with joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation. With joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation. And they would chant this as the priest would bring it back. He would bring this water that represented life back. He would pour it then as an offering to God. And they would sing songs from the Psalms, continuing to give thanks to God incredibly dramatic and vivid thanks to God for his gift of water, his gift of rain, for the water that came out of the rock in the desert, for his provision, for providing and supplying them with life represented by the water. And it was likely against, right in this, it says, at the last day he stood up And against this background, and perhaps at that very moment, when the priest is pouring the water out, Jesus chooses to reveal who he was and what he had come to do. And his voice rings out as the water's being poured. If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, streams of living water will flow from within him. And it's as if Jesus was saying, you're thanking and glorifying God for the water which quenches the thirst of your bodies. Come to me if you want water that will quench the thirst of your soul. This is who Jesus is. This is who Jesus reveals himself to be. When he shows up, something happens and that something is life. That something is a water, a thirst that you have in your soul will be quenched because of Jesus. Jesus knows timing. Jesus knows timing. He knows when to show up in your life. He knows that he is working on something even when you cannot see it. He shows up and he knows what is best and the best he knows what it looks like because he is good, God is wisdom and God is love. And while his timing doesn't make sense or maybe unexpected, we know that is exactly what our heart and soul, our physical and our spiritual life needs. I think it's interesting because we need to know this for our own personal lives, for our families, for our ministries, for our church of Inspire, the mission that we have here. We need to remember this because this is who God is in our lives and this is who he sends us to be into the lives of other people. We come here and we meet him in the scriptures, hopefully daily in our lives or weekly in our lives. We come to him to get that water that quenches. We come to fill up with the water of life so that we can pour out to those around us who are parched and in need of that life. Jesus was in tune with God to know his timing, to know the timing that was needed because he knew that he was here to make an impact And he makes it clear in scripture, you and I, we're here to make an impact as well. We are here to make a difference. He told his brothers, any time is good for you. He doesn't say the same to you and I. He does not say, he calls us salt and light. We are are intended as salt and light to make something happen wherever and whenever we show up in the world. So when we show up, Wherever we show up, something should happen. Something will happen. The question is, are we looking for opportunities like Jesus for that something to be good? Whenever we show up, what kind of something happens? Whether you're showing up on the phone, whether you're showing up at a store, whether you're showing up at work or with your family, whether you're showing up with your neighbors, whether you're showing up in a conversation or talking on Facebook, wherever you are showing up, what good is about to happen? Calling us salt and light in Matthew makes me think that we're supposed to be bringing out the tastier side of life that can make people smile and say, now that's better. That moment, this situation in my life, in the community, that conversation, it is a much better tasting place because you have shown up. And as light, when light shows up in the darkness, people can see. When light shows up in the darkness, we get to see each other as we are. We see clearer. When we have light, we don't stumble. When light comes into the darkness, it helps find a way. We are cheered when we come out of darkness into light because we have hope, because where there is light, there is life. And this is what we're called to be. It is imperative that we as God's body, 
We as God's arms and hands and mouth and feet and soul and heart and mind, we understand that we like Jesus, with Jesus in us, are to make an impact in this world everywhere our feet take us, everywhere God sends us. As a gathered community and as individuals, we are to make impact for good. When we show up, something's going to happen. With God in our lives, that something is going to be good, and it's going to make an impact. And that's what I look forward to as God continues to reveal in our lives, as we continue to walk with Him as individuals and walk with Him as a community gathered body. We will continue to make that difference and be that water that pours out to others. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for your scripture. Thank you so much for sending Jesus to reveal to us who you are, your heart, your mind, your spirit, that we can, in those times that we are in darkness, those times that we are parched, those times that we are confused and we don't know what to do with the situation in our lives, that we can be reminded through chapter seven and through the rest of scripture that you're a God who shows up. You're a God that shows up and when you show up, things happen. And those things, because of who you are, will always, always be good. We may not feel it. We may not feel it. We may not see it. But this is where we have to have that faith, God, that trusts in you, that holds on to you, that clings to you in the darkness, holds on to your right hand until you lead us through. And so, God, as we learn that in our lives, may we be like those people who said, you are indeed God. We believe, we have faith, we will follow. Let that be our response when we see you and know you. And may we be like you, water poured out to quench in our community, the needs that are there, the people who are desperately in need of hope, tangible hope, that we don't just stop at a word, but we take action to follow. Thank you, God, for being here. Thank you for showing yourself to us. And go with us now as we are that salt and light. In your name we pray, amen.